from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Please provide a warm welcome to David Troy Ayer. Hi. How are you guys doing? So uh, first a question, like how old were you when you first learned that the restaurant Arby's actually stands for the initials RB, which stands for roast beef? <laughs> Just now, right? <laughs> Just now. Don't say you didn't learn anything at the book festival. I am really, really happy to be here. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone see me? Does my head look like a light bulb or like a copy of Michel Foucault's head? <laughs> Either way is a win in, in my book. Um, but I'm really, really happy to be here, not only because Washington, D.C. is my birthplace. I know. So I went back in the, the well, where I was born. Um, but I've always wanted to come to the festival, and they've never invited me until, well, till now. And, um, and I think, see, I, I, I suspect there's a reason for this. I wrote a blistering op-ed in the New York Times about Dan Snyder and the Washington Redskins, right? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, mad props to the New York Times, but I pitched them. I said, you know, this is a big issue, like last fall. I said, we should, you, I should do an op-ed for you guys. And they said, no, that news cycle is dead, so we think not. And I said, whatever, okay. And then they called me in the spring. They said, you know, this issue has come up again and we'd like you to write an op-ed. I said, finally, right? So I wrote this blistering op-ed and then a, within a week I had an invitation to this festival. <laughs> <coughs> so I think there, there must be some relationship between the two. But I've, I've thought a lot about, you know, the mascot issue. I've thought a lot, a lot about the Redskins and, and I've, I've one thing I've always thought is, you know, Snyder is sticking to his guns. He thinks this is a really great name for the team, and he really wants to stick with it. But the popular image, American Indians, right, this sort of dominant narrative, the, the national myth of Native people is that we lost. Right? I don't know. I, don't, I think it's a myth. I think that's untrue, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. right? So why would you want to name your team... I mean, that's what I'm thinking, right? You have a team full of winners and perseverers and succeeders and, and very tough people, and why would you want to name them the Redskins anyway? I can think of a much better name for the team, you know, which, which sort of suggests success and strength and perseverance, if not intelligence. I think we should call the team the Washington Dan Snyders. <laughs> right? Go Snyders. <laughs> Fight on Snyders, right? Never give up. Like, never gives up. And, did, you know, he formed this foundation, the Washington Redskins Original Americans Foundation, right? And the acronym for the Original Americans Foundation is OAF. <laughs> right? Anyway. Hope they lose. I had to say it. So anyway, I'm really, really glad to be here. And I hope to spend most of the time today, um, not most of it, but at least half of it, trading conversation. Because writers tend to live in caves and sit in front of their computers or tablets or notebooks and don't talk to people. And so coming to these things is, is a real treat and a real privilege. And so I hope we can spend a lot of it talking and having a conversation a bit later. Um, first, I think I'll talk a little bit about Res Life and how it came to be and the thinking behind it. Um, I had never intended to be a nonfiction writer, so, so the writing of the book came as a surprise to me as much as the contents of the book um, ended up, or what the, what the contents ended up being. I, I'd never had any ambition to be a nonfiction writer. I was quite content writing novels, which is to say I was quite content lying all the time. And um, I was very happy just making stuff up. To me, that was, that was where the pleasure was right, as a writer. Imagining things, creating things. 
and I had no intention of being a nonfiction writer, but uh, for a couple of events. And, and one of them occurred in 2005 when there was a school shooting on Red Lake Reservation. I don't know how many of you remember the shooting at Red Lake. Um, it got very weird coverage, but I was, I was in New York visiting friends, and my brother called me, and he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm hanging out. Are you sitting down? I said, what's wrong? He said, there's been a shooting. Now, Red Lake Reservation is just up the road from Leech Lake, where I'm from. It's, it's maybe a half hour away. And um, my father used to work there. My mother used to work there. My sister worked there. I used to work for that school district back in the day. Um, not as a teacher, but as a, as a grant writer, but I was in that school all the time, the high school where the shooting took place. So in, I forget the date, but in 2005, Jeffrey Weiss, this, this Red Lake kid, stole his grandfather's gun, shot his grandfather and his grandfather's girlfriend, drove to the school, shot a security guard, and then started shooting his teachers and fellow students. Right? Nine people, including Jeffrey, were dead by the end of the day. So I turned on the news, and um, I was so far from home, I, w I, was, I was so devastated. And I turned on the news, and all of the news was the same. Like, all of the headlines were the same, and I was getting really, really mad, and I started pacing my friend's apartment, and I was cursing, and I was pacing. And uh, all the headlines were, th were the same on a poor, remote uh, reservation tragedy strikes. Right? That's about all anyone had to say. And I was getting really livid. I was just I was so pissed off. My friend said, what's the problem? What's the, what's the problem? I said, they're not reporting the news. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, they're not reporting the news. For instance, when, when the shooting happened at Columbine, the headlines did not read, on a fairly wealthy, largely Anglo, ex-urban suburb, really bad things happened. I mean, in all seriousness, at the, during the shooting at Columbine, they did not feel compelled to bring up race or class. But these were all sort of signifiers that suggested the same old sad story about Indians and the reservations that we are from. It was not the news. As I told my friend, I said, this is not the news. CNN, NBC, Fox, NPR, they're not reporting the news. What they're reporting is the same old sad story about Indians that everyone thinks they know. They're not reporting anything new. They're not reporting anything true. We're not learning anything about these places that we're from and that we love very much by listening to this kind of reporting. It's not news. It's storytelling. That's what it is. So I was mad, and I stayed mad, and I stayed mad for a really long time. And I was still mad when I was talking to an editor at Grove Press about something else. And, uh, and I was talking about this, the shooting. This is within the, a week of the shooting. I said, you know, no one, no one has really told the story of reservations, the true story of reservations, the, the, the reasons why they're so important. Important to the country, but important to us, too. Because, you know, we don't just, you know, we don't live on our reservations because they suck. I mean, that's not, that's not what keeps us going back for more. Like, ah, more tragedy. All right. It's been weeks since my last tragedy. I can't wait, you know. I feel sort of like I need more of that, right? So I was talking to him about it, and I was saying that, that the real story of reservations had yet to be written. And, and Morgan said, well, I've always wanted to publish a book like that. But what native writers write nonfiction? And this is, this is just a writing rule number one. When you're presented with a publisher who wants to publish a book and they're looking for the writer to write it, you lie. <laughs> right. The old novelistic habits sort of can serve you. He said, what native writers write nonfiction? And I said, none except for me. <laughs> That's it. I'm the only one. Yeah, which is not true by a long shot, right? But and he said, well, you want to write it for us? I said, I think I must. <laughs> and, you know, so, so we, we did a deal, right? We had a little handshake. We did a deal. It was great. And um, um, I have to confess that I thought it was going to be super easy, right? I mean, it really did. I'm from a reservation. I've, I, I know how to do field work. I've been trained to do field work. I'm native. Right? I know who to talk to. I'm educated. I wrote 
novels. And novels are hard. How hard could nonfiction be? I mean, right? I mean, fiction, you just have to, you have to make up the whole thing. But nonfiction, well, you know, you talk to people, you learn what they say, you write it down, it's already kind of, the facts are kind of there, you just sort of put it together and off it goes, right? And so, um, so I spent two years writing the book and I handed a draft into my editor at Grove and uh, I was so proud of my draft. And he uh, called, he's a long silence, right? Long, a uh, month's long silence. And um, he calls me up, he says, well, we, you know, we need to talk about this. And I said, great, I'm really excited to put this to bed and finish it out. And he goes, well, you know about that. Um, you know, we think that, um, we think that you need to, you need to start over. <laughs> and I said, if I start over, you mean that there's some really good stuff and maybe I can reframe it a little bit and do a little more research and kind of reconfigure how it all fits together. And he said, no, I think what we're saying is that we bought a book from you and this is not that book and you should throw out what you have and start over. I was, I mean, I didn't know what to do, right? You know, I was trying to keep my cool. No one had ever said that to me before. <laughs> and uh, it was, but he was right. I mean, writing nonfiction proved much harder than I anticipated, and for a really specific reason, at least in the case of, of Res Life. I knew only what I didn't want to do. I did not want to tell the same old sad story. I did not want to present the lives of Indian people as the same old tragic tale of suffering, of loss. I knew that to me, reservations are more than simply basins of suffering, right? Um, that the nation can check in on when they wanna see how bad some people really have it. And then they go to Pine Ridge, right? Look at some Aaron Huey photographs, which I don't like. And so I knew what I didn't wanna do. I didn't wanna do that stuff. Because in truth, you know, reservations to me and my experience of them just as a citizen of one are complicated, interesting, you know, parts of this larger country. Not, most people think of reservations as in America, but not of it. And my experience has always been that reservations are very much of it. But I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to tell that story. I didn't know how to move beyond that. And so, Another thing happened, um, and I want to read a little bit from the book um, on this score, but another thing happened, uh, something very painful, much closer to home, but it was in that that I found a way out of the trap that I was in. I did not know how to write the book. That was the trap. Um, what happened in 2007, in August of 2007, was that my grandfather committed suicide. And so it was in his suicide that many things sort of, were transformed in our family, but for me particularly, um, I found some, some answers that led then to, to a path, uh, a good path into writing the book. So I'll read a little bit from the beginning of, of Res Life. I should say that Res Life is, um, I don't know what the percentages are, but you know, 50% history and 40% reportage and journalism and about 10% memoir. Um, Hampton Sides called it a melange of history, journalism, and memoir, and I just like saying melange, so <laughs> it just rolls off the, right, so, but the part I'm going to read is a memoir part, but, but it's a book that's meant to be of some utility, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Um, on August 3rd, 2007, I drove past one of the signs on the southern edge of my reservation on my way back to Bina, our ancestral village. My grandfather had killed himself earlier that day. Eugene William Seely, an 83-year-old veteran of D-Day in the Battle of the Bulge, a man who left the reservation only once in his life and made a promise never to leave again, an Indian man who dodged thousands of bullets, shot himself in the head, and died alone on his bedroom floor. My grandfather was not an easy man. He was not one of those sweet, somewhat bashful, elderly Indians you see at powwows or feasts or the clinic willing to talk and tell dirty jokes. Not the kind of traditional elder that a lot of younger people seek out for approval or advice. 
not the kind of woodsy Indian man who will take you hunting and explain patiently how to lead on ducks or where to find the best mushrooms. When we were kids and my cousins and siblings and I came into the house from playing, more often than not, he would say, get the hell out of here. He was, and everyone will tell you this, something of a hard ass. But you know, this is the thing, right? This is the thing I've discovered about nonfiction is just when you think you know somebody, right? Philip Roth, I think, says this in American Pastoral, where you know, you know, you think you know someone and you get them wrong. And then you got the right version and you get it wrong again. And just when you think you figure that out, you, you figure out that you're wrong again. And maybe that is actually what life is all about. I think there might be some truth to that because after I wrote this book, I went to the bank, I took over payments on his truck, which was not paid off. And I went to the bank and I went to the tellers. I said, yeah, my grandfather died. I want to take over payments on his truck. And, and they said, well, who's, oh, we're so sorry. Who is your grandfather? I said, Eugene Seeley. They said, oh, he was so sweet. <laughs> he was so great. He was so funny. I said, no, not Jack Seeley, Eugene Seeley. Jack's his brother, right? And they said, yeah, 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 yeah. Skinny, white hair, kind of looked like Elvis. I was like, yeah. Right. So uh, just when you think you know somebody, somebody else will give you a completely different version of them. Right. This is the way it goes. But his looks reinforced this impression of him being kind of a hard ass. He was thin and rangy. He wasn't especially tall, but he seemed tall. His hairstyle never changed. It was long and swept back, and at first it was black, and then it was gray, and by the time he was an old man, it was all white, and he held it in place with brill cream. Um, in a lot of pictures, he poses without a shirt on, and we went through our photo albums uh, you know, at his wake, and in half the pictures, he's just like, Paul Mall, sunglasses, no shirt, you know. He was the only person I knew who had a sword hanging from his wall, and in my book, because when I was a kid, I played lots of Dungeons and Dragons, and anyone who had a sword on their wall was automatically tough. Right? The family story is that it was a Nazi officer sword and he took it off a German corpse. And so once when I was in high school, I actually got up the nerve to ask him, hey, Gramps, uh, you know, is that a Nazi sword? Ah, oh, hell no, he said. That there's a Knights of Columbus sword. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, where'd you, where'd you get it? Well, I traded a Luger for it. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, where'd you get that? And he looked at me. He had this way of looking at you that made you feel like you were the stupidest person to ever live, right? Just like, where do you think, boy? I shot a German and I took it. <laughs> I never asked him anything like that again. But when we were growing up, when I was growing up, we were never close. He scared me. We did not have a lot to say to one another. Um... He was also very stubborn. In the 1950s, he was living with my grandmother and their four children in a small two-bedroom shack in the small village of Bina. Who's been to Bina? Yes. You know what I mean. Bina's infamous. It's an infamous little village. The shack that they were living in had been built around the turn of the century, and at the time of its construction, it was the only house with walls and a ceiling. Everything else at that time was still uh, wigwam bent poles covered in bark and tin or tar paper or what have you. So at the time of its construction, it was quite a palace, but all it was tiny. Right? By the 1940s, it was pretty run down. All of the family lived in this rundown thing. No running water, no bathroom, wood stove to cook on. The family was very poor. And my mother remembers one winter when they had, I don't know, they had a little change jar, I guess, and they only had 35 cents left in this change jar. And my grandmother said, Gene, why don't you go downtown? There's one store. Go downtown and uh, get us some food. Okay. You know, takes the 35 cents. He's gone for a while. Comes back. And he does not have any food, but he has a plaque that says, the Lord shall provide. That <laughs> some dude, you know, probably painted in prison, right? <laughs> like in woodshop. And so my mom says my grandmother was really mad, but she kind of kept it together. And so for dinner, my grandmother made what my mother refers to as poverty biscuits, which are just baking soda, water, flour, and maybe lard. And somehow they turn into a biscuit. I don't know how it works. And um, she fed all the kids first, which is very unusual. Usually my grandfather got served first, and then the kids get their food. But he didn't get served first. She served all the kids. And then 
My grandfather's sitting there with his fork and his knife, and he's waiting to be served, and she puts the plaque on his plate. <coughs> and she says, if he's going to provide, but you're not, eat that. And he was offered a job. Shortly thereafter, he was offered a job. Now, he always tried to find work. He was wounded in the war. He had shrapnel through his shoulder. He, he, he'd worked logging for a bit, but then a tree fell on the same shoulder, and so he just couldn't do the kind of physical labor that was really one of the few jobs open to Indians at that time. You could work in the woods. It was basically it. But he was offered a job as a dam keeper in, in the village of Federal Dam. And the dam keeper's job was really easy. You just had to sit there and sort of measure water levels. Right? It's government work. You got a government salary. And a house with electricity and running water and heat. Right? The dam keeper's cottage, which was something that wasn't really a cottage. It was like a three-bedroom house. It was nice. And he turned it down. My mom remembers them arguing about this, my grandparents. And my grandmother, Jane, you know, it's only eight miles away. It's eight miles away. Federal Dam is the nearest village to Bina. Right? It's only eight miles away. And he responded by saying, I made a promise to God if I made it home, I'd never leave again. This is home. And I'm going to keep my promise. I'm not leaving. Right? This was some promise he made during the war. If I make it out of this, I'm going home. Bina and that house, that was his home. He wasn't going to go, not for anything. He was stubborn. The town he wouldn't leave, Bina, is a population around 140, and it has a very bad reputation. It's really only known for two things, a really cool-looking gas station that's on the National Register of Historic Places, I think, and um, the number of outlaws who call it home. And I, I, I tried to find statistics for the book, and I heard one that one out of three males in Bina had done more than six years of hard time. I mean, this is my family, right? But I don't... I couldn't get any hard data on that. It's like, were you in jail? Oh, you know, maybe. I asked my grandfather. He was talking about being in jail. I said, what were you in for? He says, oh, well, I don't remember. I was like, you remember why you go to jail, don't you? Isn't this something you would remember? Right. But <coughs> um, so in addition to the gas station, it has a bar and a post office. Bina used to be a lot bigger. It used to have three gas stations, two hardware stores, two grocery stores, seven hotels, and two bars. It's a big deal. My grandmother's father, known to everyone as Grandpa Harris, even to his daughter, my grandmother, um, owned both bars during his lifetime. He was a Scot from Chicago, and he ended up in Bina logging, I guess, and married my great-grandmother, Jibboy woman. He bought the Wigwam Bar, then sold it and bought the Kitigan, which is a, a mispronunciation of Gitigan, which is the Ojibwe word for garden. So, beer garden, but in Ojibwe. Um, when he owned these bars, his in-laws could not drink at them because it was illegal to serve liquor to Indians, right? So he served liquor to his in-laws out the back door, and then they would come in the front door to dance because everyone likes a good dance. And so my grandmother said, yeah, by the end of winter, there was like a tunnel through the snow from the back door to the front door, right? Because everyone drank out back and they came around the front to dance. Harris was, and this is according to everybody I interviewed, um, Harris was something of an asshole. My great-grandfather. Once he was fixing the roof of the kid again and someone walked by and they thought they were going to get one over on him. They thought they were going to tease him and sort of come away sort of victorious, right? He says, hey, what you building, Harris? A whorehouse? Right, and he's got nails in his teeth, and he's holding a hammer, and he takes a nail out, and he looks down, and he's like, if I were to build a whorehouse, I'd have to put a roof over the whole town. <laughs> right? <laughs> Rugged people. <laughs> right, so I come by it honestly. You know, don't blame me. Blame my ancestors. How much time do I have? Yeah, 20. <coughs> so when I got, I got the news of my grandfather's death, um, I was up there that evening, and um, I was really concerned about my mother and my grandmother. My grandmother is one that found him, and my mother saw the, where he'd shot himself. And my grandmother asked me to do two things that morning, the next morning when, I, when she woke up. And uh, she asked me if I'd write a eulogy for his service. And I said, okay, I can definitely do that. 
and she asked me also, would I go up to the big house where he lived? They lived in separate houses. They separated, and my grandmother moved about 100 yards away. So how we do it? What's the point of being mad if someone can't see you being mad? <laughs> right? There's, there's no point. So, you know, you've got to keep it going. So she asked me to go up to his house, to the big house. Everyone called his house the big house. And um, clean, up, clean up his brains, essentially. And I said, okay. She says, you know, your uncles, they can't look at that. They can't deal with that. You know, and I think she asked me to do this not because he and I had been close, but because compared to the rest of my family, you know, I, we hadn't been compared to, at least, you know, his sons, my cousins. They couldn't do it. I said, okay. She spent the whole morning cleaning his room, moving the stuff out of his room, his bed, his dresser, his clothes, the stuff on the walls. My grandmother said, I want there to be no sign of what happened there. So I had to clean the entire room. I had to rip out the carpet 